as if conversations about money weren't awkward enough, they're made worse when someone crosses the line. And to make matters worse, everyone's interpretation of where that line begins and ends is different. Honestly, it's safe to say the line is invisible, and you only know you've crossed it when it's too late. This is why it's so important to understand the motivations and values of the people you're having these financial conversations with. Whether you're talking to your partner, sibling, or parent, it's important to remember the same bonds that connect us also act as boundaries. Is there ever a scenario where you're having a financial intervention with someone who isn't your romantic partner or isn't a family member? And I I agree with you. I think it depends. Like we can all kind of watch other people's behaviors, but the yeah. intervention intervening on on our behalf, on their behalf, feels like a very intimate step in a relationship. In a lot of the cases that that come to mind, and even in my own experience, uh, where that struggle comes into play actually isn't with a partner or a sibling at all. It's with with a parent, with mm-hmm. a, you know a parent that you are giving money to or expected to give money to in the future. A lot of the people that I know that are a part of our community really kind of struggle with having conversations and interventions because they like they want to have an intervention because but it's coming from this like emotionally charged place or so already frustrated because they're you know under the belief that like there's this unspoken rule that is kind of binding them to provide this kind of support and um it's it's a really really tough place to be this whole kind of sandwich generation dynamic that a lot of folks are dealing with so I'm, again I'm, I'm really glad that you wrote that book we recommend it all the time because I think a lot of people really need that help. They just mm-hmm. like tell me what to say um, or at least how to start this conversation and also tell me what not to say, what to avoid so that I don't actually make this entire uh, interaction more complicated. I would say, especially with parents, you're flipping the script on them yeah. because you are trying to parent them in this moment, which no matter how wonderful a dynamic you have with your parent. <laughs> I'm going to guess it's not going to be received well the first time you go at bat and try to have the conversation. And it that's why it's really important, one, to never do it in a heated moment. You never want to be making a comment at a point where you have hit frustration. Maybe this is like the third time this month they have asked you for money. You are also have your own things that you have to be financially handling. Maybe your life has changed and all of a sudden your financial concerns are different. The first thing is to never assume that they know what is happening in your life. Like just because maybe you've gotten married, bought a house and had a kid, they don't necessarily have all the context there to be like, oh, now all of a sudden you have this mortgage payment and you all of a sudden have a childcare payment and your grocery bill is higher because there's another mouth to feed. And that means there is less disposable income to support another family member, like a parent. So contextualize it for them. But in a moment where like, I would love to talk with you about some things. Could we sit down? I love the idea of temptation bundling, like order your favorite takeout, make your favorite meal, like something where there is a pleasant part of the experience involved, I think is always really helpful. And temptation bundling. I've never heard that. Yeah. (laughs) It's also just really important to be vulnerable with them and saying the language around, I love you. I want to support you but this has changed in my life or I am trying to do this. So I no longer can and insert what's happening or I'm feeling. And, you know, if you're feeling taken advantage of put words to it, but explain the why, like, of course I want to support you and love you and care for you. You are my parent. You gave so much to me, but I'm feeling like I'm being put in a position where I don't know where this money is going you know, I, I gave you 1500 bucks this week. I thought it was going to rent and groceries and you just bought a new TV. So like, where did that money come from? Mm-hmm. And again, you're going to try to parent them. They might not respond great the first time. And it's okay to be like, this is escalating. I do not want to get into a fight about this. Why don't we both take some time to take a beat, walk away from it and come back in the future? A couple days, a couple weeks. I also feel like it's helpful to bring in somebody else if they're not responding great to you, the child. So that could be a family member that you trust. That could be a community leader that you trust. It could be a doctor, depending on the situation. I also like the in-law dynamic. You know, so many people talk about like, ooh, monster in-law, whatever. Um, If you have a great, healthy relationship with your in-laws, you actually might be the right pick because 
you are a child to them, but you're not the child that they raised. They love you, they trust you, but there's still a different dynamic there. Yeah. And I say this from some experience because guess who's the one that stuck to my husband's parents about all this stuff? Not in terms of financial support, but in terms of estate planning. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation because we we experience that now. I feel like there are conversations that Kirsten struggles having with her parents. Uh, if I'm just being honest, like with her, well, it doesn't really matter. It's both of them that I might be easier to sort of weasel into, right, than her. Uh, and conversely, like she has far more conversations now with my mom about money and her financial situation uh, than, than I do. Like I sort of led the way, but quite honestly, kind of folded to the frustration of it all. And I was like, you know what, this is not like this is an opportunity for you all to bond, but I feel like you might be able to kind of make more progress, uh, make her a little bit more comfortable, uh, sort of strip away the sense of shame, quite honestly, that I think uh, my mom felt in having those conversations with me that I don't think exist nearly uh, as, as much when she's having them with, with Kirsten. You know, I don't always love to make it a gendered conversation, but sometimes it can be a gendered conversation in the sense mm -hmm. that if it's a mother with sons, she might feel more comfortable talking to a daughter-in-law. They might also be able to put themselves into situations like whether it's going and getting your nails done together or like going shopping together or just like going to something that feels a bit more, you know, traditionally gendered, if you will, but to put somebody at ease and to be able to also talk to somebody who might understand certain parts of a struggle in a very different way. And again, that's why I think sometimes, even though you are the child, you love your parent, you might not be exactly the right person to have the conversation, or it's you and somebody else, as long as the parent doesn't feel ganged up on if it's just one. And if it's both parents, maybe you should have another person there so you don't feel ganged up on. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed this episode of Cashing Out the Podcast. To see more videos like this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to turn on your notifications. To get your copy of Cashing Out the Book, visit Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, your local bookstore, or download the audiobook on Audible.